please welcome on stage Professor Olayinka David West as she comes to tell us why financial inclusion is everybody's problem. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Are we still asleep? No, 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 we shouldn't be asleep. It's an exciting day and it's an exciting topic. And I would like to commend the organizers for putting this together because this is also coming on the back of the CBN's International Financial Inclusion Conference, which just ended yesterday. And at that conversation, we had global conversations to showcase Nigeria in what Nigeria is doing around financial inclusion. And the theme of that was really financial inclusion for all, scaling innovative digital models. And when I come on the back of that with this, and we're now talking about it in the realm of fintech, right? And that fusion of financial services and technology is critical because today we don't know what financial, tomorrow we don't know what financial services are gonna look like. And it's important that we start to pay attention and we start to put Africa back on the map regarding where we are. One of the, I think it was when I was sitting here, one of the adverts said, oh, financially, um, Nigeria has raised, or Nigerians have raised a lot of money in the fintech space. And it is true. But it's not just about raising money. Raising money is an, is an entry point. Raising money is validation that you have a product or a service that you can sell and that can change lives, okay? So this morning, I've been challenged to talk about financial inclusion for all. And to the best of my ability, I like to keep to time, and I'll set my timer. Sorry, do we have my presentation ready and streamed? I'll set my timer. So what qualifies me to be here? Do we have my presentation ready? Okay, two minutes. What qualifies me to be here? Well, I'm a professor of information systems at Lagos Business School, but I think I'm more like you. How many of you are engineers in that sense? Engineers? Okay. Business UX, you are UX? Okay. Product management, product development? Okay, what else is there? Owners, ventures, or just in enthusiasts and interested parties? Okay, great. I started out as a computer scientist, though, believe it or not. So if you've ever been my student, one of my students is here. Where is you, Nana? Okay, great. If you've ever been my student, one thing I tell my students is, I started out as a computer scientist, and I'm proud to tell all of you, I can't write a line of code to save my life. And a lot of people are surprised when I say that, and I say that boldly, and I say it proudly, because again, in the realm of technology and computer science, there's many, many roles that we can play, right? So it's not just about the engineering side. The engineering side is good, but the people who are good at it are good at it. So let's not just think that, oh, I must be an engineer before I can do well in this sector, all right? So I can't write a line of code, but then I went on to work in technology, I went on to work in banking, and then I decided that, you know what, now nah, I've had enough of all these people. I want to teach. So 20 years next year, I would have been uh, at the Lagos Business School. But it's not just, thank you. It's not just teaching in itself. It's really about networking and connecting with people. Because what do we do through education? Through education, we change lives, right? We empower people. And my role was, how do I get people to like technology? Because in those days, it wasn't about, IT wasn't mainstream like this, so it was really, oh gosh, why do I need technology? Why must I, you know, I've been into a class once where someone looked at me and said, what do they even want to teach me about IT? After you have the IT people, right? So there was a separation, the geeks and the business people. And they put the geeks in the back office and that was it, right? Great. But then again, what we've been trying to do for 22 years since the turn of the millennium, COVID did in one month. Technology became mainstream. 
And so it was an opportunity. Someone said to me the other day, the only people that enjoyed COVID were IT people. So let's use this as an enabler that now we have the voices and the words of business, right? How do we use this to transform business and society? And that's what you should think about. How do I transform business and society? Because what's the point of having a product or an app that has all the features in the world, right? But doesn't change someone's life. Or doesn't enable people to do things differently, better, and transform them. And that's the challenge I'm here to give you today. In a specific area, financial inclusion. And how did I get talking about financial inclusion? I like talking. I'm a teacher, right? So talking is what I do. But then again, sometimes I try and make sense. OK? My daughter says I talk a lot of nonsense. But then again, so what happened? The opportunity to do research. What is research? For us in academia, it's yes, to publish and perish and to write, get our names in papers and in journals. But for me, research is really about investigating scientific inquiry to understand what are the phenomena that we need to be working on. What should we be doing? Now, what are the nuances of Nigeria? Because you see, whether we like it or not, we're all different. What works for you might not work for me, right? And the an example I use is Apple and Android, because we're all familiar with those, right? There's so for some people, an Android device is intuitive. It's easy to use, right? But for some other people, an Apple device is difficult. We all wired differently. And that's why we say UI, UX, right? It's important, because you want it to be intuitive. Another confession. Guys, this presentation is taking longer. Another confession. When I first opened Excel, when I started my career, and I just saw rectangular boxes, I closed it because I didn't know what to do with it. And that's how technology is, right? When you open it, do you know what to do? Or are you just going to be, oh gosh, you have to read a manual. How many of you have ever read a manual? I can't. If I can't figure it out in five minutes, then it's difficult to use. And that's how people are, irrespective of education. So let's talk about the included. How many of you really know what financial inclusion is? Because I think that's a lot of what we need to understand first. So it's not just about, oh, doing it for the people that are already known. It's really doing it for the people that are unknown. C.K. Prahala had said, there's fortunes at the bottom of the pyramid, right? And there is fortunes at the bottom of the pyramid. Okay, so there's no presentation. We're going to do this off book. Financial inclusion, what is it? There are many definitions of financial inclusion, but one of the key definitions or one of the key takeaways for me is the World Bank's definition. It's about access to financial services. Formal financial services, right? It's about usage of financial services. How do we use the financial services that we have? You know, yes, having an account is not financial inclusion. Because having an account means that technically you're included, but then if you're not using financial services, so that means at the end of the month, your salary goes into an account, right? And the, on that day, that very day, you go and you suck it all out, right? And then you take it away. You're not using financial services, so we're not deepening, right? Then it's also about affordable. And what do we mean by affordable? So how many of you really know how much your bank charges you? Hmm? Okay, so you know, sometimes we, we tell ourselves that affordability is for the poorer people, right? Especially my students. I teach a lot of executives, and they come and tell me that, oh, you know, it's because they can't afford it. And I'm like, I use, and it's all about giving the reference and the right example. So how many of you recently, when Eco Hotel started charging for parking, how many of you, and I asked them, when Eco Hotel started charging for parking, when you go there for an event, where does your driver park? Do you let him park inside? Or do you tell him to go and park on the road somewhere outside and when you're ready, he comes back in to call you? Right? 
Because it's all affordability and it's relative. Why should I want to pay 2,000 Naira for parking when I can pay 200? So it's a mindset issue, ladies and gentlemen. It's not the value. It's the mindset. So I asked a student of mine one day, why do people use Android? She said, Android, a lot of things are free. And the power of free is something that we all like, right? If they told you that, oh, pay for this event. Hmm? Some of you paid, thank you very much. All right? But if they, didn't say, if they said pay, if they said don't pay, this place will be full of. But again, what do we value? Because knowledge, like I said, is transformational. So when we look at financial inclusion, it's access to usage of affordable and quality financial services. What do we mean by quality? You see, a lot of people I meet come and tell me, oh, I have an app. It does this, it does this, it does this. But you see, first of all, when you tell me you have an app, you're telling me something. You're only speaking to a certain community. Only about 25% of Nigerians have smartphones. So that already gives you the size of your market. And when you look at Nigeria, and you look at the headline numbers, right? What do we tell ourselves? 206 million people or in the financial inclusion space, half of them over 18, right? 106 million have uh, over 18. That doesn't mean you're going to serve 106 million, right? Because you have to now ask yourself, what is the size of my addressable market? And your addressable market now depends on what parameters or what filters. You all understand filters. You've been abusing CB and that they just went to use uh, Snapchat filters on the currency, right? So what filters do I use to refine and define my addressable market? So if, for example, you have an, you're building an app, and you tell me that, oh, so for me, that means 25, only 25% 25 of the smartphone owners have access to your app, right? And then you begin to drill it down. So when we talk about products, products are critical because that's also one of the missing links around financial inclusion. We're all building for ourselves. Nobody is building for your village, right? Because everybody wants to blow in Lagos and say, oh, I want to be a unicorn, I want to make, you know, I want to raise, etc." So you realize that, that from the supply side, there is a mismatch to the demand. Because the demand is where the opportunity is. But then again, there is a mismatch because we're all looking at solving problems or addressing markets that are already served. So when we think about financial inclusion, it's access to quality. And quality also means protection. How many of you have gone to an ATM and it didn't dispense? Hmm? Or you went to a POS and it chopped your money or something or the other, right? Think about the process of getting your money back. Was it pleasant? Did it automatically reverse like they said? No. But then again, imagine this is you. You have access. You can go to the branch every day. You can send an email. You can make a phone call. Imagine the woman selling ground nuts across the road. Can she leave her stall to go and fight with the bank? Can she? Why not? Sorry? She'll be losing money. Exactly. Because that ground nut she sells that day is what is going to put food on her table that day. So it's a real no work, no pay. So that's the challenge. How do we ensure that these products work and work for everybody? And then you, the other day I had an issue with my bank. And they were doing me like this, like this, like this. And I like to play it out because if I don't understand, how can I advocate for those who are suffering? So my bank now said, oh, well, this was even on us bank. And they now said, oh, well, they can't really trace it. The merchant hasn't done this, that, that. I said, no problem. You leave me no choice but to escalate this matter to the Central Bank of Nigeria. Immediately, he escalated it to his boss. 
Why? And I said, well, too late. I've already sent the email to the central bank. And it's a very easy email address, cpd at cbn.gov.ng. And they would respond and acknowledge. Within two days, I got my money back. But the bottom line is, I have the access, I have the knowledge. Because people are ignorant, doesn't mean we should play on them, right? So as you're thinking about your products and services, think around that. Another thing I want us to think about is, have you ever heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Yes. And we know that we have physiological needs, we have emotional needs, we have social needs, and at the top we have self-actualization self needs. When you think about it, I'm paired with financial services. And when we talk about financial inclusion, remember I said access to and use of affordable and quality financial services. So it's not just banking and payments. How about insurance and social protections? How about pensions, saving for my future? How about investments and wealth, right? Or doing this here, and that's one of the things they're trying to do in Piggy Vest, right? How do we ensure that we make this thing more accessible? You know, you don't have to have five million naira before you can own, you can start investing. Why not do it now? But it's really about, can I invest 1K? Because the danger, I don't know about you, but with me, if I have 1K, I will spend it. So it's better for me not to have it. All right? So when you think about all those things, is how do we deliver these services? Many years ago, I have, um, I have two kids, and they were younger, and they, wanted, they had savings accounts in one of the banks, and they wanted to spend money over Christmas. So I said, okay, no problem. This is your account number, this is Biro. Let's go to the bank. So I took them to the bank, and I sat down in the corner, and I told them, I pay school fees, right? You know how to read and write. This is the form, sort yourselves out. And I knew it would take us a long time but I enjoyed the experience and the interaction because I realized something that day. We don't build products and services for the markets we want to serve. Because when my children were filling the form, they struggled because it wasn't in language they could understand, right? And yet every financial service provider has a children's account. Then we go and teach financial literacy as theory, right? Why don't we take them into the bank and let them interact and know how to use banking products and services, right? So when you go into the bank, go, how many of you go into the bank on payday? When you look at it, a lot of people that are work collecting money are the blue collar workers, right? And some of them have education, but they struggle with writing, right? Or they, and that's where the security men come in. When you look at those square boxes, right? Can they even accommodate your own handwriting that you that you did calligraphy and all these things? Talk less of somebody that's just trying to manage, struggling to write the zeros, the zeros, the zeros, the ones, etc. So that's what I mean by the delivery channels that we use. The forms that we use. Are they fit for the markets that we're serving? Or are they just, oh, we've printed a form and it doesn't matter? Because when you look at UI, UX, right, it's the experience. Are we making it seamless and easy for that person? Or are we just saying, oh, we've ticked a box? And so with, you need to think about it from the shoes of the person. A couple of years ago, we tried to ask ourselves, who is the excluded Nigerian? And we did a customer segmentation study. And in that customer segmentation study, we identified six personas. Some are um, rural, some urban. That's my 20 minutes. All right, and I'll be rounding up now. Some rural, some urban. And in doing so, we realize that if you don't know who the people you're trying to reach are, and start to frame your how might we statements, right? How might we solve this problem for Mr. Kadri here? Or how might we solve it for Yinka? Because the way Yinka looks at it and the way Mr. Kadri looks at it might be coming from different lenses. But what we try and do is we try and say, no, Yinka, you must do it like him. Mr. Kadri, you must do it like her. But then how do we think around the problem and solve it universally? 
So ladies and gentlemen, when we talk about financial inclusion, just imagine a beggar on the road, right? Or the beggars on the streets. He's begging for money. So that means he has no income, right? Even when he does get income, he's using it for his physiological needs. After doing that, okay, he might, you might be generous one day and give them a couple more. So he might have savings, right? Or he might be able to save. But can he go to Piggy Vest to save? No. Can he even go into a bank branch to save? No, because he doesn't have NIN, doesn't have KYC, doesn't have BVN, right? So what does he do? He saves it in his shoe or saves it under his mattress, etc. One day he falls asleep, he loses the shoe. That means he's lost his savings, okay? He falls sick, what happens? Nothing, because he can't afford health or doesn't have health insurance. He continues to age, and as you live rough, you age, you, age, you degrade easily, right? And he doesn't have a pension, etc. So, what, ladies and gentlemen, I think the saddest thing is that it's actually more expensive to be poor. How many of you have ever taken one of these digital loan things, right? The interest rates are killing, are they not? But then again, the people that don't have access to formal, where do you think they go to? And they're paying 3x, 4x what you're paying, right? But yet they have no choice. So how do we begin to expand the choices of other Nigerians? How do we take away discriminations and biases that we have and really think about Nigerians? How do we start to look at the interfaces? Must I be able to speak English to use products and services? In India, they have different languages. If I'm building for Nigerians, why must it be in English? And those are the things that we need to challenge ourselves with. Because it's really about getting in, moving from a red ocean to a blue ocean. Okay? So the imperative is that, ladies and gentlemen, we need to rethink inclusion. We need, you're sitting here to talk about fintech. It is a fusion of financial services and digital. But it's what do we choose to see? Who do we choose to see as our audience? Imagine that, go back, teleport yourself back to that village scene. What will that look like? What could that look like is what we should be asking ourselves. Because at the end of the day, should education, should socioeconomic status, should rural living be inhibitors or limiting factors? No, they shouldn't. But then again, in our environment, we've made them limiting factors. Things like infrastructure, it will change. But then again, it would only change if we make it our problem. When we think it is somebody else's problem, then it won't change. And that's why this theme of financial inclusion is everybody's business. It's everybody's problem. Because the bottom line is, what happens to us, the haves, right, versus the have-nots? is that we're going to be dishing out more in terms of benefits. We're going to be more at risk. One of the things in Lagos today is that you can't move anywhere without being robbed, right? But do those people not have a right to eat? And if we are getting fat and they are getting lean, it's only what's going to happen. So it's, all, it's our collective responsibility to think about creating a sustainable society. And like I said earlier, digital is now mainstream. Let's use the talents that we have and address a socioeconomic problem like financial inclusion. Not because we're going to make it like bandits, but because we're going to change lives and give people an opportunity to save, even if it's 10 cowboy a day, because over time, that 10 cowboy a day can send somebody to school, and it can change somebody's life. 
So ladies and gentlemen, we are now putting financial inclusion back mainstream. But you know what? We can't do it alone. The central bank can't do it alone. NCC can't do it alone. Academia can't do it alone. And that's why everybody is needed. Because it's about how do you and me contribute to making Nigeria that great place that we want it to be. You know, they say you have to create the future that you want. So the charge I have for you today is, ladies and gentlemen, as you think around the future of fintech, don't think around the future of fintech for yourselves, please. How do you take fintech to that town hall meeting? And you see, we have the creative minds to do it. So it's just now, let's start peeling the onion one layer at a time to get to the core. And you know what? When we make it, right, it, takes a, it makes life easier. So I would urge you, think about insurance, social protections. Think about pensions. Because again, even in this room, if we do a poll around the different financial services, we're not included. Correct me if I'm wrong. Hmm? So it's not just banking and accounts and payments, but even beyond banking and payments. And then for us now, we're also asking, what's beyond financial inclusion? It's financial health. You want to be financially healthy. You want to be able to walk in somewhere and get a credit score and know that you can, you can get credit. But then again, it's not just about you and me. It's about everybody, every single Nigerian. So ladies and gentlemen, use today to think about that. Use today to think about how do I use my own different talents to do that? Don't forget, I can't write a line of code, right? So it's not just about the engineering side. All right, there's the thinking side, there's the testing side. And I want to urge you to really, really use this as an opportunity to join hands with us and say, let's build this ecosystem that really transforms society. Because when we think about the SDGs, right, we have 20, 30 to go. Eight years is not very long, but you know what we have? We have a vibrant population of people who are willing to do the work. And we can do it. So let's think about it. Let's think about human dignity. How do we provide the same level of dignity accorded to us, to every single Nigerian? On that note, ladies and gentlemen, I wish you Happy deliberations and all the best in your work. Thank you so very much, Professor Olayinka David West.